Well, hey, everybody, and welcome back to Living Power, your online Bible study, where we are walking through the Bible in a year. This is April 27th, and we are studying the book of 2 Samuel. We are studying the life of David, and today we are looking at his family and some of the things that happened with his sons. We, um, we see it's, it's kind of difficult reading. Um, you know, when I think about Tamar and what happened with Tamar, um, I can just, I'm in the room with her when I'm reading the story, and I'm preparing the dough with her, and I'm innocent as she is, not even realizing the danger that awaits her as she's in the room with her brother, and then he turns on her, and she's um, devastated. And so if we really read this and think about what that action meant to, um, to her life and what she lost, her dignity, her purity, uh, the fact that she may not ever be able to marry, and um, the ashes pouring on her head and the tearing of her clothes showed the intensity of her sorrow. So this is the story that we read today. This act was conducted against this woman who was his half-sister by a man called Amnon. And Amnon was the um, son of David who was to inherit the throne. And so um, it's, just, it's just sad reading today. I know there's a lot of things in Scripture that elicit lots of different emotions. And today I'm just feeling very sad about what happened to this uh, poor girl. Her, I guess that was his, that was her half-brother, Amnon. Her full brother, um, Absalom, looks after her, allows her to live in his home. He doesn't say anything about her ever being able to marry or having children. We don't know about that. But Absalom uh, takes her in and he um, waits for the appropriate time to take his revenge. Now, let's go back to Leviticus 20, verse 7, and see why this is a shameful disgrace. In the law, in Leviticus, it says, if a man marries his sister, daughter of his father or mother, and has relations, it is a shameful disgrace. They must be cut off from the community, and since the man has violated his sister, he will be punished. This is in the law of God. She knew it was a shameful disgrace. She begged him to marry her, which um, really, according to this, they probably couldn't have even done. But if he had, it wouldn't have been certainly such a disgrace. Um, he was the half-brother, not the full brother. However, he was not willing to do that. And um, he just rejected her and sent her on her way. Now, remember yesterday in the lesson, Nathan the prophet had told David that the Lord had said that the sword will never depart from your home. This was part of the punishment in David's um, sin with Bathsheba, but mainly killing one of his, which could have been one of his men in the army, one of the 30. Uriah is listed in 1 Chronicles and 2 Samuel in the honor roll of the, the mighty men. And Uriah certainly in the reading demonstrated noble character. He wasn't going to go party, wasn't going to go spend time with his wife while the army was in battle. And he waited until he could go out and go back to battle. That was Uriah. That was Bathsheba's husband whom David killed. Because of that sin, um, the Lord has said, the sword now, because you've lived by the sword, the sword will never depart from your home. We are starting to see that being fulfilled. And David throughout his life will have trouble amongst his own family with insurgency and murder and um, just sibling rivalry in the biggest sense. And that's what we're starting to see. Okay, Absalom, we learn, is the son of David also. Did you notice it mentioned something about his long hair? It was just a little blip. You might have missed it when you read it. 
but his hair weighed five pounds. And he was a very handsome man. And I mention that because his hair is going to get him in trouble later. We're going to read about his hair again. So I didn't want you to get to the point and think, well, what, what's his hair got to do with this? Why did they put that in there? It is <clears throat> significant later on. Um, he did, after he threw this party and killed Amnon, his half-brother, he left and he exiled himself and went to live with his maternal grandmother for three years. We will um, see in the reading today that he goes on to have children of his own. He names his daughter Tamar after his sister. It's not the same person, but he names his daughter Tamar. And we will begin to see over the next couple of days his desire to take the throne. And that comes about because of resentment in something David doesn't do in today's reading. Let's continue on and I'll show you what that is. David does not have any control over his sons. You can see this. He heard what happened. Uh, he heard about um, Tamar and what had happened to her. But at no time did he go and do what he should have done. According to Leviticus 20, he should have cut his son off from the community. He should have exiled Amnon. And that man, it says, since the man has violated his sister, he's the one to be punished. David didn't do anything. He just kind of let it go. And um, <clears throat> Absalom took the situation into his uh, control. And during those three years of exile, he missed his father. He wanted to come back. He wanted to come back in the family, and he wanted his father, David, to reach out to him. Well, he comes back, and David finally <clears throat> allows him to come back, and Absalom lives in Jerusalem for two years, but is not allowed once to come before the king. David does not ask him to come. It's during this time, this two years, that Absalom starts in his heart to grow bitterness and resentment against his father David, and which leads him later to rebel against him and try to take the throne. So I think what we can learn from this is, you know, we have great responsibility as parents. None of us are going to be perfect parents, but it's just important to love one another and be merciful in all of the situations of life, whether it be our son, our family, a friend, anyone. I wonder if David had been more merciful to Absalom if, you know, the situation might have changed and maybe history wouldn't have turned out the way that it did. Interesting, too, that David's sin was similar to his son's. Now, um, you know, this lesson is difficult for some of us because Many of us um, are, find ourselves estranged from our own family at times, <clears throat> and certainly we find ourselves estranged from God in certain periods of our life. There are peaks and valleys. Spiritually, we have times where we feel very close to God, and then other times in our life we feel like He's very far away. He's, he has never moved. It's usually us that has moved away from Him. And... Um, that's why I've entitled the lesson today, When We Want to Come Home, because oftentimes we want to come home. We want to come home and be restored in our relationship with God, or sometimes we just want to be restored in our relationship with a member of our family. You know, God devises ways to bring us back when we have been separated from Him. And that's in Scripture. That's 2 Samuel 14, 14. God devises ways to bring us back when we've been separated from Him. That is the last thing God wants, is for you to live a life that is separate from Him, where you don't include Him in the details of your life, in the day-to-day. -day. He wants to be, He wants you to drag Him in to all of your decisions, all of your feelings. He wants to be the first person that you share them with. When I was in student life and a youth growing up in church. I remember one of the youth leaders said, and I'll never forget, when you go to bed at night, God cannot wait for you to get up the next morning because he desires more than anything to spend the entire day with you. Wow. How about that? When we want to come home, God is always there 
to embrace us and just love on us and bring us back. God always finds a way to bring us back when we've been separated from Him. Sometimes we're separated from people that we love. Sometimes we have control to fix it, and sometimes we don't. Certainly, if it's in our control, we want to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, forgive them and move to reconciliation. But sometimes things happen, and it's not in our power. And in that case, we lift it up to God, we lift it up to the Holy Spirit, and we allow the Holy Spirit in His time to orchestrate events so that we can be reconciled with the people that we love. God is a God of reconciliation, and if you are waiting this day for God to do this great work in your life, I'll remind you that in Scripture it talks about God's mighty hand and God's outstretched arm which is a very important principle to understand about God when we're waiting on Him to do something. God's mighty hand means an act that He is doing right now, that He, he is doing at this moment of time, and then it's done. But God's outstretched arm is a picture of His working in our life, something that takes even Him longer than a day to orchestrate. And I'm here to tell you today that God's mighty hand is doing something right now in your life. But his outstretched arm is also hovering over you because he is continuing to do a good work, whether it be reconciliation with someone that you want to be reconciled with, you need to be reconciled with, or if it's some other mighty work in your life. So I would encourage you to continue to pray and be patient as God works envisioning his mighty hand and his outstretched arm working in your life. Well, I hope this has been a blessing to you. It's been my pleasure to be with you today. I hope you're enjoying this Bible study. I just love being your teacher, helping you to understand as we walk together side by side through the Bible this year. Well, blessings on you and your family. Until next time, shalom.